All right, this baby's ours now. The Normandy. Stand by, shore party. Decontamination in progress. I heard what happened to Captain Anderson. In progress. Survives a hundred battles and then gets taken down by backroom politics. Just watch your back, Commander. If things go bad on this mission, you're next on their chopping block. Captain Anderson should be the one in charge. It's like I'm stealing the ship from him. Yeah, the captain got screwed. But it's not like you could have stopped it. Nobody's blaming you. Everyone on this ship's behind you, Commander. 100%. Intercom's open. If you got anything you want to say to the crew, now's the time. <laughs> Fuck's sake. Now we do things my way. Nah. This is Commander Shepard speaking. We have our orders. Find Saren before he finds the conduit. I won't lie to you, crew. This mission isn't going to be easy. Okay. Humanity must do its part. Rousing speech time. For too long, our species has stood apart from the others. Now it's time for us to step up and do our part for the rest of the galaxy. Time to show them what humans are made of. Mm. Wherever Saren goes, we'll follow. Wherever he searches for the conduit, we'll be there. We will hunt him to the very ends of the galaxy and bring him down. Humanity needs to do this. For her own sake. But for the sake of every other species in Citadel space. Saren must be stopped. And I promise you all, we will stop him. Well said, Commander. Captain would be proud. <laughs> he doesn't matter anymore? Man! The bottom right options are so rude! The captain gave up everything so I could have this chance. We can't fail. Yes, sir. Man, I wonder how different. I mean, probably very different. Like a full renegade option playthrough is. Commander, something you need? How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her. And you Balance do. Isn't what you'd expect. I assume. Takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. Okay. I like to know my crew. Mind if I ask you a few questions? <laughs> I can see where this is going. You did a background check on me, didn't you? Well, I'll tell you the same thing I told the captain. You want me as your pilot. I'm not good. I'm not even great. I am the best damn helmsman in the Alliance fleet. Top of my class in flight school, I earned that. All those commendations in my file, I earned every single one. Those weren't given to me as charity for my disease. Uh, interesting. Oh, are you contagious, fuck's sake. Is it rude to ask? It's probably rude to ask, right? I'm sorry, Joker. I didn't even know you were sick. You mean... You mean you didn't know? Oh, crap. Okay, I've got Froelich syndrome, brittle bone disease. The bones in my legs never develop properly. They're basically hollow, too much force, and they'll shatter. Oh, Even with Christ. crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. One wrong step and crack! It's very dramatic. But I've learned to manage my condition, Commander. Put the Normandy in my hands and I'll make her dance for you. Just don't ask me to get up and dance unless, you know, you like the sound of snapping shin bone. <laughs> well, it's cool that he's confident about his abilities. How'd you get your nickname, Joker? Why does everyone call you Joker? Were you a member of the Phantom Thieves once? It's a lot shorter once? than saying Alliance Flight Lieutenant Jeff Moreau. Plus, I love to make little children laugh. What? You're dodging the question. Look, I didn't pick the name. One of the instructors in flight school used to bug me about never smiling. She started calling me Joker, and it stuck. Hmm. Why didn't you ever smile? Hey, I worked my ass off in flight school, Commander. The world's not going to hand you anything if you go around grinning like an idiot. By the end of the year, I was the best pilot in the academy. Even better than the instructors, and everybody knew it. They'd all got their asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. One guess who was smiling at graduation. Banta. I need to know more about this Froelich syndrome if I'm putting my ship in your hands. Yeah, of course you do. It's an extremely rare condition. Nobody knows exactly what causes it. Genetic, maybe. It's treatable, but there's no cure classify my case as moderate to severe. I was born with over a dozen fractures, hip, thighs, ankles, my bones were already Oof. breaking. A hundred years ago, I wouldn't have survived past my first year. Lucky for me, modern medical science has turned me into a productive member of society. 
You're not gonna break a bone trying to fly the ship, are you? Uh, I don't fly with my feet, Commander, so I'm fine as long as I'm in this chair. I gotta be real careful when I get up to take a piss, though. <laughs> I can do my job as well as anyone on the ship. Better, actually. So don't worry about it. Cool. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. Let's talk about something else. Whatever you want, Commander. Uh... Was, wait, was personal history the one that led to the talk about the disease? How'd you end up joining the Alliance? Look, if you're looking for an inspirational tale no, we haven't had this. overcoming impossible odds, you're gonna be disappointed. My mother was a civilian contractor working for the Alliance. I basically grew up on the Arcturus station back when they were building up the fleets. Spend all that time around Alliance ships, there's a good chance you'll end up going to the Academy. Cool. Did we do that one? Fuck, I can't remember. Let's do it again. How's the Normandy performing? Is she yeah, we did. She's speak? the best ship in the f balance isn't what you'd expect. The Normandy's probably too much ship cool. for your average alliance. Pilot. I have to go. All right. So okay, nice. sweet. Man, sometimes like there's it's crazy how big and branching these uh these conversations can be, and sometimes it's hard to remember what I've already looked at. <laughs> cool, got a codex thing. We'll be doing the codex shortly at the end of this upcoming well, upcoming part? The part we're in. <laughs> Soon. Soon TM. Right. Uh, so. If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. Then you can jump into the bin for me? We're all on the same team here, Presley. With all due respect, sir, that's what they said about Nihilus. Look how that turned out. I'm in charge here, Presley. I decide if we have non-humans on this vessel. Yes, sir. Understood, sir. Speak freely, Presley. I want to know if you have a problem with non-humans. So I can bitch slap you. It's not that, Commander. Humanity has always handled its own problems. Saren attacked one of our colonies. We should be the ones to stop him. We don't need their help. Well, that just sounds like some dumb ego shit. Some people think asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's just being stupid and stubborn. No matter how strong you are, allies can make you stronger. I guess so. Maybe I'm just stuck in the old ways of thinking. But don't worry, Commander, this won't be a problem. Well, I'm glad to hear it. How did you end up assigned to the Normandy? I signed up with the Alliance as a navigator right out of school. Following in my grandfather's footsteps, I guess. My first posting was on the Agincourt. We were one of the first reinforcements to arrive at Elysium after the Blitz hit. <laughs> Those raiders were no match for an Alliance frigate. Of course, the only reason the colony was still standing was because of you, Commander. I can't believe you held out as long as you did. How'd you end up on the Normandy? I got my officer's commission after Elysium. Must have made an impression on the right people. Captain asked for me when he was picking his crew. Nice. Carry on, Presley. Yes, sir. I got Paragon and Renegade points there. Interesting. Anyone else to talk to around here? Doesn't seem like it. Okay. What was in here? Oh, that's a different floor. I want to talk to everyone. Uh, nothing in here? No, okay. Okay, I guess we have to go downstairs then to talk to anyone else. Where was, where was the doctor? I thought the doctor was up here, but I guess not. Uh, that's down to the garage. Here's Caden. Alrighty. Anything you need, Commander? Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. What? <laughs> Pardon? What? I'm asking you for your opinion. What do you mean you've wa we've just started the conversation? What do you mean I'm wasting my time? What's your opinion on the last mission? I don't see how we could have done things any better. At least not without getting to Eden Prime sooner. And we were on the scene faster than any other Alliance ship could have been. Does there really no I've way? Enough of your time That's for weird. Commander. We'll talk another time, Lieutenant. Commander? Good chat, I guess? Question mark? <laughs> hey, here's the doctor. Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of med school. Earth always seemed boring to me. Too safe. Too secure. 
I figured the colonies were teeming with exotic adventure. Right, I wanted if we to listen travel to this, the stars, tending the... But humanity we have. needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse. And the Alliance always needs... How well do you know the Lieutenant? I'd never worked with him before this mission. Tends to keep... Yeah, we've heard all of this. Maybe because okay. of the headache. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. I guess I was expecting, like, updated stuff. But it seems like it has not been. Maybe after proper missions or something there'll be uh, new dialogue bits. Is there anyone down here? Oh, hello, sleeper pod. Where am I here? Nice. Something to look at. Cool, cool. Uh, what about this side? Where's my... Uh, where's the people... Personal manual. Grab that. Where's the people that I have, like, my teammates? The people, like, obviously Caden's one, but where's everyone else? Are they down in the, uh... Down in the garage? Rex and... Garrus and Tali. Oh, they are. Hello. Thanks for bringing me on board, Commander. I knew working with a Spectre would be better than life at CSEC. Have you worked with a Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. But CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. True. Being a Spectre does have its advantages. Exactly my point. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. CSEC's handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. Well, I mean, it does sound like a tough thing. I hope you made the right choice. I'd hate for you to regret it later. Well, that's sort of why I teamed up with you. It's a chance for me to get off the Citadel, see how things are done outside CSEC. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. Well, I mean, more like my way. <laughs> if getting the job done means endangering innocent people, then no. We get the job done right, not fast. Got it? I wasn't trying to. I understand, Commander. Good. I feel I didn't mean to encourage him the first time because I thought he was saying like, you know, there's all this red tape and now we're a Spectre, we can cut through the red tape and actually get shit done. But then it sounded like he was going more towards the I'm a fucking kill everyone <laughs> kind of thing. So I'm like, eh, no, no, not about that. Commander, good to see you. There's Rex, here's Ashley. Commander. Do you have a few minutes to talk one on one? I'm sorry, Commander. I need to get my duty squared away. I wouldn't mind talking more later, though. Is that like a romance thing? What's your opinion on the last mission? Kind of wish you'd got there sooner, Commander. No offense. I appreciate the rescue. I just wish... You wish we'd been able to save the rest of your unit? Yes, sir. If I had been more alert, we wouldn't have been cut down by an ambush. The Geth are perfect ambushers. They don't move, they don't make noise, they don't even breathe. Sir, they have flashlight heads. <laughs> again. Dismissed, okay. Chief. You know, true. Sir. They do have big old flashlight heads. Oh, now we're here. Can we upgrade everyone else in the squad? I guess not. I guess you can only upgrade other people in the squad when they're actually in your party. Nice ship you've got, Shepard. What can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. Come on. You Krogan lived for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. Like Garrus's, Garrus's race, right? I heard about that. You know, they almost did the same to us. It's not the same. Isn't it? It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? 
An uh, infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth. What? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species. Okay, no, not the same. What the fuck? Garrus? <laughs> Garrus, your species did what? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand, but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. Touchy subject. I was just making conversation. I wasn't trying to upset you. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Right. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. Hmm. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. Wait, I thought you said the Turians. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. That's crazy. Every Krogan is infected. Every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? <laughs> you ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. Well, it's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. So long, Rex. Shepard. Interesting. And here's Tali. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. This is kind of new for humanity. <laughs> the Normandy's a prototype, cutting edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. After you created the Geth and they turned on you, right? We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. 300 years ago, damn. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Makes sense. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million quarians in the flotilla. 17 million? And each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. When they said they were almost extinct, I was thinking like a few thousand, not 17 million. What kind of freedoms? It's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, 
the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. Huh. I'm, I wonder why they don't just find a place to settle down and can expand their population as much as they like, rather than stay on these rickety old ships. That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So it's a democracy? So the ultimate power rests with elected officials. In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. Ha, huh, that's a good safeguard. safeguard that served us well. Yeah. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. Oh, there's no option for, to ask what those four times were? That's really interesting. I really like that idea. That is such a cool, like, safeguard that you have to do it in unanimous agreement and then you have to resign your post. That is really smart. I like it. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Well, I would like to know. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. Whoops. <laughs> How come the council didn't step in and stop? You didn't tell them. This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. Sure. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So, the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in the group, the smarter they are. And then you made a million of them? Seems like this was like a fuck up from the start. <laughs> so there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. But that doesn't make any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Oh boy. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those. Well, oh, it means they're alive, Shepard. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, 
but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. Oh, the general no. order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. Yeah, I mean, you created life and then tried to kill it. You can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exiled, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. Not gonna lie. I feel like I'm siding with the Geth here. I mean, obviously not now, because the Geth are shit now, but <laughs> 300 years ago. They were created, they were given life, essentially, and then the Quarians attempted genocide, essentially. And it uh, didn't work out. So I feel like I'm on the Geth side for that, what happened 300 years ago. It's hard to feel sorry for you. Your ancestors tried to wipe out another species. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place. But we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? They didn't need a use for you, necessarily. Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? Well, they probably cut themselves off because they've just been in a massive war. And they've been killing anything that's tried to contact them because they're scared still, maybe? I don't know. I feel like if they'd just, like, gone, oh shit, they're actually intelligent. Let's stop using them as slaves. Let's engage them. And, uh, here's a new race. And then we just move from there. It wouldn't... I don't know. It seems like they're assuming that the Geth would have just, like, gone, Hey, let's murder the Quarians. But if they'd, you know, not tried to kill them first, maybe it would have all just turned out okay. They didn't kill Saren. What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians, all organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren, and that's why we have to stop him. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Is it ever not accepted? Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Hmm. 
Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. I want to talk about something else. Like what? Uh, I think that's it, right? Yeah. I should go. Wow. See you later. That was interesting. That was a lot. Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. Is she bothering you? I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. Yeah, she's useful. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth systems. How does it work, exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually, the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. Poof. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. And at that point, they're not gonna fucking catch us if we go faster than light, right? Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Yeah, the but then we're already can gone. Pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight. But oh, the short or exit. Our oh. stealth systems are amazing, and we've got the only one. Guess it depends how far they can scan then. Where else have you served, Adams? You name a class of Alliance ship, I probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo, only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on, probably the fastest vessel ever designed. She's the only one using the new Tantalus Drive Core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Core? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, but we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Cool. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Right. I think that is everyone, right? I believe. Very cool. So, let's head up. I didn't expect there to be so many, uh, so many people to talk to and for so such long conversations. It's very cool. I love hearing more about the lore of all these characters. Tali especially is very interesting. She had a lot to say. Even though I don't necessarily agree with her. <laughs> but uh, it was very interesting nonetheless. Um, did I go through here? What was through here? Oh yeah, just this joint. Right, well, that is the end of the regular bit of the episode. Uh, but we will now head on into the codex. What's the journal say actually? Uh, find the missing researchers. Oh, right. Yeah, these are things. Recon team. Find the matriarch's daughter. And look up the geth. Right, yes. So, we've got a bunch of codex stuff. We have a lot, I believe, of codex stuff. So, that is what the rest of this part will be. Uh, first up, let's go with secondary. Let's do this. We'll do some skim reading of the secondary. Uh, Krogan Genophage. Okay, maybe I won't skim read this. This seems important. The Genophage bioweapon was created to end the Krogan rebellions. From the start, the Krogan had overwhelmed the council. Only timely first contact with the Turians saved the council races. Oh! The Turians fought the Krogan to a standstill, but sheer weight of Krogan numbers indicated the war could not be won through conventional means. The Turians collaborate collaborated with the Salarians to genetically engineer a counter to the rapid breeding of the Krogan. So, that's some bits that Rex left out there. The Krogan were massively breeding and, like, they're very aggressive, I guess, it seems like. And they were going to wipe out the council races and they were just, like, expanding an empire of Krogan. Interesting. The Genophage virus 
gained the energy to replicate by eating key genetic sequences. Every cell in every Krogan had to be altered for the weapon to be foolproof, otherwise the Krogan could have used gene therapy to fix the affected tissues. Once a genophage strain could find no more genes to eat, it would starve and die, limiting spin-off mutation and contamination. This created genetic flaw is hereditary. The Salarians believed the genophage would be used as a deterrent, a position the Turians viewed as naive. Once the project was complete, the Turians mass-produced and deployed it. The Krogan homeworld, their colonies, and all occupied worlds were infected. Right, so the Salarians didn't expect it to be used, but I mean, if you're making the nuke, you gotta wonder, don't you? The resulting mutation made only one in a thousand Krogan pregnancies carry to term. God damn. It did not reduce fertility, but offspring viability. The rare females able to carry children to term became prizes the Krogan warlords fought brutal battles over. The Krogan are a shadow of their former glory. While the rebellions took place centuries ago, they are constantly reminded of the horror of the genophage and of their inability to counter it. The release of the genophage is controversial, bitterly debated in many circles. Yeah. Wow, what would I have done? If you've got this species that's fucking just expanding and murdering everyone, I don't know. If you're the Turians, I can see why they'd release it, but at the same time, it's like... That's, it's not genocide, but it's like, it's getting that way, and I'm simultaneously arguing against that when it comes to the Geth. But then the Geth were not attacking. The Quarians just assumed they would, whereas the Krogans were attacking, it sounds like. So I guess that's the difference. The Krogan Rebellion. So this is what was actually happening before the Genophage. After the Rachni War... I don't think we know about that either. <laughs> the quick breeding Krogan expanded at the expense of their neighbours. Warlords leveraged their veteran soldiers to seize living space, while the council races were still grateful. Over centuries, the Krogan conquered world after world. There was always just one more needed. When the council finally demanded withdrawal from the Asari colony of Lucia, Krogan overlord Kredak stormed off the citadel, daring the council to take their worlds back. But the council had taken precautions. The finest STG operators and Asari huntresses had been drafted into a covert observation sports. Sports? <laughs> Force. The Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance. The Spectres opened the war with crippling strategic strikes. Krogan planets went dark as computer viruses flooded the extranet. Sabotaged antimatter refineries disappeared in blue-white annihilation. Headquarters stationed... Headquarters stations shattered into orbit-clogging debris rammed by pre-placed suicide freighters. Still, this only delayed the inevitable. The war would have been lost if not for first contact with the Turians who responded to the Krogan threats with prompt declaration of war. Being on the far side of Krogan space from the Council, the Turians advanced rapidly into the lightly defended Krogan rear areas. The Krogan responded by dropping space stations and asteroids on Turian colonies. Three worlds were rendered completely uninhabitable. This is mad. This is crazy backstory. This was precisely the wrong approach to take with the Turians, each is first and foremost a public servant willing to risk his life to protect his comrades. Rather than increasing public war weariness, Krogan tactics stiffened Turian resolve. The arrival of Turian task forces saved many worlds from the warlord's marauding fleets, but it took development of the genophage bioweapon to end the war. There were decades of unrest afterwards, rogue warlords and holdout groups of insurgents refused to surrender or disappeared into the frontier systems to become pirates. Wow. Wow, there's so much backstory to this universe. I love it. It's going to take a while for me to remember it all, I feel like. But I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job so far, so we'll see. Quarian's economy. This is what we just learned a lot about from Tali, so let's skim read this. The migrant fleet has little economic base operating in a state of perpetual hand-to-mouth. Uh, da -da -da. They have, like, basic stuff covered, but they're pretty limited on gear. They earn income in creative ways. Uh, the Conclave strategically determines the course of the fleet to bring in resources and income. Why? I don't get why they don't just settle down somewhere, though. A species who suspects the migrant fleet is headed toward their space often offers a gift. Well, that's nice of them. After they pass through a system, swarms of mining vessels work over asteroids for metals and siliceous materials. Uh, this sparks conflict with corporations because they want the shit. They've got skills, they're experienced. Corpor the very corporations that lobby against the Quarians have made backroom deals with the fleet. Oh wow, amazing. Quarians are widely hated among the working classes. The Quarians are coming to take our jobs, is a common response. Amazing. You hate to see it. Uh, government. We learned a lot about that. They have the right to send representatives to the Conclave. 
Yeah. Admiralty defers the Conclave. That's the overturning safeguard. Ship captains have authority over their vessel. Uh, da -da -da. Yep, okay. Clan vessel captains are not subject to dismissal by the Admiralty. Abusive captains are a family problem if they do not disrupt the operations of the fleet. Huh, that's a little yikes. The migrant fleet is the largest concentration of starfaring vessels in the galaxy, sprawling across millions of kilometers. It can take days for the entire fleet to pass through a mass relay. Oh wow, yeah, huh. Feels bad to be caught in that queue. When the Quarians fled their homeworld, the fleet was a motley aggregation of freighter shuttles and vessels and the odd warship. After three centuries, they will support larger crews, uh, they achieve stability, weeding out ships not suitable, uh, da -da -da. former freighters, quarians enliven these spaces with colourful quilts and tapestries. Traffic control, station keeping, supply distribution and so on are under military jurisdiction. Uh, ships have split off to p pursue individual goals and return days or years later. Uh, the pilgrimage is what the young ones do to achieve adulthood. They go and get shit. They bring it back to the ship they want to go to. Because uh, they can't all stay on the ship they're born in. Because otherwise they wouldn't be able to breed after a while. <laughs> uh, they wouldn't be able to have viable kids. Because it would all be like keeping it in the family. Yikes. Cool. Okay. Uh, Citadel and Galactic Government. We read that one. Serpent Nebula. This is what we saw when we looked out that window. Surrounded by a blue tinted reflection nebula, the light of the nebula is actually light from the citadel scattered and reflected back at the station. Ha! Huh, that's cool. At first, it was assumed to be made of microscopic construction debris. Prevailing theory holds that the Protheans use molecular nanotechnology to manufacture the incredibly durable materials used in the citadel. But unlike other nebulae, the serpent does not dissipate, therefore it must be replenished constantly. Current popular theory is that non-recyclable waste collected by the Citadel's keepers is somehow rendered down to the atomic or molecular level and ejected. The thick nebula presents a navigation hazard. Beyond the relatively clear areas around the Citadel, electrical discharges are common. These are not blocked by kinetic barriers and can severely damage metal-framed starships. In addition, some dense knots of dust can overwhelm the repulsion of kinetic barriers on smaller ships. If such a vessel is moving fast enough, the effects are similar to being hit by a sand blaster. Attempting to reach the Citadel through open space is unadvisable. The only safe approach is through the various mass relays that orbit it. Cool. Humanity. Uh, military ranks. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we can all basically understand that. N7. This is what Shepard has on his uh, thing, right? On his suit. The MVC consists of one letter and one number. Uh... The letter notes career path, so N is soldier, I guess? The number indicates level of experience. All 26 levels are used and numbers run from 1 to 7, so N is letter code for special forces, right? So Shepard is the highest level of special special forces, nice. Planets, Arcturus Station is the gateway to Sol, a 5 kilometer diameter Stanford Taurus type space station at the trailing lag range port point of the gas giant Themis. Okay. <laughs> when humanity activated the Karen mass relay, it led to Arcturus 36 light years from Sol, Earth's sun. Arcturus is the third brightest star seen from Earth. It is an ancient red giant from the generation born before Sol. Do do do. The expense was acceptable due to strategic value. Arcturus is actually from the galactic Halo. What? <laughs> One of a cluster of 52 stars that are crashing through the disk of the galaxy. In a billion years, it'll be sailing through the depths of extra, extra galactic dark space. Ships and vehicles. FTL drive appearance. New space travelers ask, what does it look like outside a ship moving at faster than light speed? Part of the answer can be seen in the simple pane of glass. Light travels slower through glass than it does through open air. Moves slower in conventional space than it does at high speed mass effect fields. Causes refraction, okie doke. Goes up to redshift, it's very pretty. Da da da, alright. Uh, crew considerations 10 meters of space. Hot bunking is the norm. You've got life support stuff, gravity. Warships normally turn off their anti off their A grav systems during combat, reducing heat generated. Cool, cool. Cruisers. <laughs> Standard combat unit. Routine independent show the flag patrols. Dreadnoughts, ultimate arbiter of space warfare. 
They are the big boys with the big guns. Turians have a shitload of them. Fighters, single pilot combat craft, small and agile. Frigates, light escort and scouting vessels. Uh, da -da -da. Transport stuff, I guess. Cool. That is all of the secondary ones. Uh, how many have we got here? Oh my god, we've got a lot. We've got a lot to listen to here, but at least, uh, at least I'm not going to wear out my voice now because we can listen to the dude. In the early 2160s, the Alliance began aggressive colonization of worlds in the Skillian Verge, much to the dismay of the Batarians, who had been developing the region for several decades. In 2171, the Batarians petitioned the Council to declare the Verge a zone of Batarian interest. The Council refused, however declaring unsettled worlds in the region open to human colonization. In protest, the Batarians closed their Citadel embassy and severed official diplomatic relations with the Council, effectively becoming a rogue state. Banta. They instigated a proxy war in the Verge by funneling money and weapons to criminal organizations, urging them to strike at human colonies. Hostilities peaked with the Skillian Blitz of 2176. An attack on the human capital of Elysium by Batarian-funded pirates and slavers. In 2178, the Alliance retaliated with a crushing assault on the moon of Torfin, long used as a staging base by Batarian-backed criminals. In the aftermath, the Batarians retreated into their own systems and are now rarely seen in Citadel space. Good banter. The Krogan evolved in a hostile and vicious environment. Until the invention of gunpowder weapons, eaten by predators was still the number one cause of Krogan <laughs> fatalities. Whoops. Afterwards, it was death by gunshot. When ah. the Solarians discovered them, the Krogan were a brutal, primitive species. The Solarians discovered them and then nuclear fucked winter. them over? The Solarians culturally uplifted them, teaching them to use and build modern technology so they could serve as soldiers in the Rakhine War. <laughs> they had a self-inflicted nuclear winter. Liberated from the harsh conditions of their homeworld, the quick-breeding Krogan experienced an unprecedented population explosion. They began to colonize nearby worlds, even though these worlds were already inhabited. The Krogan rebellions lasted nearly a century, only ending when the Turians unleashed the Genophage, a Solarian-developed bioweapon that crushed all Krogan resistance. The genophage makes only one in a thousand pregnancies viable, and today the Krogan are a slowly dying breed. Understandably, the Krogan harbor a grudge against all other species, especially the Turians. Interesting. That's very interesting that it was the Solarians that raised them up initially, and then the ones that created the genophage. Driven from their home system by the Geth nearly three centuries ago, most Quarians now live aboard the migrant fleet. A flotilla of 50,000 vessels ranging in size from passenger shuttles to mobile space stations. Home to 17 million Quarians, the flotilla understandably has scarce resources. Because of this, each Quarian must go on a rite of passage known as the pilgrimage when they come of age. They leave the fleet and only return once they have found something of value they can bring back to their people. Other species tend to look down on the Quarians for creating the Geth and for the negative impact their fleet has when it enters a system. This has led to many myths and rumors about the Quarians, including the belief that underneath their clothes and breathing masks, they are actually cybernetic creatures, a combination of organic and synthetic parts. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> hey, uh, Tally, can you take off that mask a sec? I need to check something. Pharos, no, Pharos is a habitable world in the Attic and Beta Cluster. Two-thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been repeatedly picked over by looters many times. Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization, as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris, and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the Human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to thoroughly explore the ruins. 
The pioneer settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers, using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. Noveria is a cool, rocky world with most of its hydrosphere locked up in massive glaciers. That's a nice blue. A privately chartered colony world, the planet is owned by the Noveria Development Corporation Holding Company. The NDC is funded by investment planet? capital <laughs> so from weird. two dozen high technology development firms. I guess in the future is no different from owning a building though, I suppose. Their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Noveria's surface. These facilities are used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere, as Noveria is technically not part of Citadel space and therefore exempt from council law. By special arrangement, Citadel special tactics and reconnaissance agents have been granted extraterritorial privileges, but it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. Given its unique situation, it is understandable that Noveria is often implicated in all manner of wild conspiracy theories. Cool. There are between two and four hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and less than one percent of them have ever been visited or had their systems properly surveyed. Plenty for the quarians to land on then. Early expansion into the Attican Traverse was haphazard. A desperate race to claim habitable planets where populations can be economically settled. Ignored in the wake of this land grab were thousands of less hospitable worlds, each potentially rich with industrial resources. The wealth of entire solar systems lies untapped, waiting for corporate survey teams or independent pioneers to discover and exploit them. However, this is not an easy task. In addition to the environmental hazards, the fact that uncharted worlds are largely ignored makes them popular bases for criminals, revolutionaries, cults, and others who wish to remain unnoticed by galactic society. Amazing. <laughs> Faster than light drives use element zero cores to reduce the mass of the ship, allowing higher rates of acceleration. This effectively raises the speed of light within the mass effect field allowing high-speed travel with negligible relativistic time dilation effects. Starships still require conventional thrusters, chemical rockets, commercial fusion torch, economy ion engine, or military anti-proton drive, in addition to the FTL drive core. With only a core, a ship has no motive power. The amount of ESO and power required for a drive increases exponentially to the mass being moved and the degree it is being lightened. Very massive ships, or very high speeds, are prohibitively expensive. If the field collapses while the ship is moving at faster than light speed, the effects are catastrophic. The ship is snapped back to sublight velocity, the enormous excess energy shed in the form of lethal Cherenkov radiation. Sounds like a bad time. Larger warships are generally classified in one of four weights. Okay, not gonna lie, we're Frigates skipping this one. This small, is... Fast ships I feel like we get this. The Normandy is a prototype starship developed by the Human Systems Alliance with the assistance of the Citadel Council. It is optimized for scouting and reconnaissance missions in unstable regions using state-of-the-art stealth technology. For most ships, the heat generated through standard operations is easily detectable against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, is able to temporarily sink this heat within the hull. Combined with refrigeration of the exterior hull, the ship can travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert observation. This is not without risk. The stored heat must eventually be radiated or it will build to levels capable of cooking the crew alive. Another component of the stealth system is the Normandy's revolutionary Tantalus Drive, a Mass Effect core twice the standard size. The Tantalus Drive generates mass concentrations that the Normandy falls into, allowing it to move without the use of heat-emitting thrusters. Amazing. Biotics is... An artificial intelligence is a self-aware computing system capable of learning and independent decision-making. Creation of a conscious AI requires adaptive code, a slow, expensive education, and a specialized quantum computer called a blue box. An AI cannot be transmitted across a communication channel or computer network. Without its blue box, 
An AI is no more than data files. Loading these files into a new blue box will create a new personality, as variations in the quantum hardware and runtime results create unpredictable variations. The geths serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of rogue AI, and in Citadel space, they are technically illegal. Advocacy groups argue, however, that an AI is a living, conscious entity, deserving the same rights as organics. They argue that continued use of the term artificial is institutionalized racism on the part of organic life. The term synthetic is considered the politically correct alternative. Interesting. That was, there wasn't anything else here, was there? No. And final section. Combat. All modern infantry weapons from pistols to assault rifles use micro-scaled mass accelerator technology. Projectiles consist of tiny metal slugs suspended within a mass-reducing field, accelerated by magnetic force to speeds that inflict kinetic damage. The ammo magazine is a simple block of metal. The gun's internal computer calculates the mass needed to reach the target based on distance, gravity, and atmospheric pressure, then shears off an appropriate-sized slug from the block. A single block can supply thousands of rounds, making ammo a non-issue during any engagement. Top-line weapons also feature smart targeting that allows them to correct for weather and environment. Firing on a target in a howling gale feels the same as it does on a calm day at the practice range. Smart targeting does not mean a bullet will automatically find the mark every time the trigger is pulled. It only makes it easier for the marksman to aim. That's really cool. I like that they've explained it's not just like a gameplay thing. It is this ammo magazine being a block of metal and it just shears off a slug from the block every time you pull the trigger and it's a small amount and so that's why you never need like that's why it's infinite ammo essentially because these blocks just keep providing for such a long time. That's really cool. I didn't expect an explanation. I like it. Well, there we go. That was a pretty fucking huge uh codex session how, how long have we been playing now that is now six and a half hours six and a half hours and we are finally ready to go on our first proper mission i mean we had a mission right at the start but you know our first first mission in charge so we will be doing that next time hope you're enjoying if you are if you could leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already share the videos around share the playlist around if you can i would really appreciate that and i'll see you next time for more Mass Effect. Thanks for watching. See you then.